The effects of the prehistoric Aurora event in the minds of the Earthlings who witnessed it led to a symbolic cultural uprising from which the original meanings became forgotten in our time. What if the plasmatic event in prehistory can be linked from everything from the scarab symbol in Egypt to the Stonehenge monument in Britain and even down to the headdress of the Native American population? The Native American headdress is just another representation of the immense charged particles of prehistory interacting with our planet's magnetic field. Of course, these particles in the Aurora Borealis are incredibly tame compared to what happened in the past. As the Birkeland Curtain develops into a spiral, much like water going down the drain, it begins to pinch off as the gravitational influence takes hold and this creates a series of very bright plasmatic spheroids generating lightning the entire length of the structure, developing further into a donut-shaped column through hundreds of years of generating visible and intense ultraviolet light and x-rays and other electromagnetic radiation that would have devastated any established society at the time. As the structure violently merges and it becomes over-energized, eventually it will release a violent shockwave of catastrophic proportions. As this interacts with Earth's atmosphere, it generates visions to the Earthlings of seemingly dancing squattermen people and the appearance of goat horns as the shadow wave display become evident to the observer. From lab research and studying the evidence left by ancient observers, it appears that as the energy increases, the high energy plasma column in the polar cusp passes through various consistent phases. Since electric currents are prone to pulsing, the appearance of the display would therefore fluctuate back and forth from one energy phase to another. The upper terminus or outer rim of the Aurora's column is usually represented in rock art as a very large, round, bright disk. Plasma is mainly concentrated in the outer surface of the funnel with a central, often red-colored axis. Sometimes it is drawn with the Aurora's column below it and depicted as a series of concentric rings oscillating with spikes emanating outward from the outer circle. This is often misidentified as an image of the sun, which is actually never seen as anything other than a usually yellow disk except rarely during a solar eclipse. Surrounding the funnel are plasma bundles or rays. Starting from 56, they reduce in number to four as the energy increase through time. There are represented in the petroglyph rock art record as pinwheels, sailing ships, spiky disc, bullhorns, or what even resembles a fancy crown or full-fledged Native American headdress. Bill Petrie writes that when water goes down the drain, you notice that the flow is funnel-shaped and hollow at the top, and that as the funnel develops, the flow slows down as well. This is kind of like what happens as the outer rim of the polar cusp. Here, the plasma flows around the axis, leaving a low pressure pool in the top valley of the polar cusp. When plasma gets trapped here, it gives rise to what is called the aurora, beginning its life as a wisp and often quite prominent in many petroglyphs. The feature is often pictured bird-like and so could be seen as the proverbial phoenix rising from the fire. They are portrayed at all stages of the high-energy aurora, with many different forms having been recorded in ancient rock art. Several distinct forms would be noticeable. For example, eye and nose mask are the result of small side eye circles above an oval-shaped nose. In the area where the eyes would be between the spherical isophytes, a distinct X pattern would often develop, as well as more complex hourglass patterns. The final stage of the silky column would be when the developing tauros inside shine through, giving rise to what appear to be faces with goggles or large eyes. They are known as face masks. With increasing energy input, the celerity spheroids begin to flatten under the pressure of the inflowing plasma. With the 
shimmering bright white outer envelope has mostly dissipated, leaving a stack of distinctly donut-shaped toroids. The speeding electrons, now flowing in circular paths around the axis, generate synchrotron radiation, giving the stack a brilliant bright white appearance. And even at this stage, you would readily notice the perspective changes from an on edge at the bottom to oblique at the top of the stack. In an actual column, the central axis would most likely be red in color. You would be able to see through the forming toroids, and they would appear as two bright circles side by side, just like when you cut a donut in half. As the flow of the electric current increases, the toroids flatten and begin to warp and fold at the top and bottom. The top toroid will deform and cup upward. A feature or head has also developed inside the rim at the outer end of the axis, which may be entered or to one side. The bottom toroid will also warp and the base appears to look like a bell or Christmas tree stand. Depending on the perspective of the viewer, the column of toruses can take on a branched configuration resembling segmented animals or even plants. Images depicting this stage are often referred to as ladders or caterpillars. The incoming plasma has two components, energy intensity and flow. Increasing the flow of the incoming plasma puts enormous pressure on the toroids, causing them to take on a decidedly melting appearance. The stack would be relatively stable in number, but the shape is in flux. As the intensity of the current continues to rise, the column is further deformed, losing the base and most of the flattened toroidal shapes. The intense pressure forces the remaining toroids to merge and give rise to a wide range of box-like geometric shapes known as pipettes. A pipette is a long, hollow glass tube, which is used as a graduated dropper for liquids. These forms are generated by fluctuating forces acting on the decreasing number of toruses. The experience of witnessing such an event must have been quite moving as the toruses would flip back and forth violently from one shape to another. We are now approaching the greater energy levels observed for the high energy aurora. The remaining toroids have wrapped and produced well-defined vortex curls at their edges. What's left is a solitary toros and the remnants of two others giving a bowl shape at the top and a bell-shaped below. The remaining central toroid is often depicted as tubular, flat or spherical dial in shape, and sometimes the drawings resemble folded petals or mushrooms. Occasionally, the ends of the warped toroids branch and resemble fingers, toes, or lightning. This gives the zoomorphic frog and lizard, or the anthropomorphic squatter man, or interpretations for the figures. Remember, the auroral column is a three-dimensional, radically symmetrical structure. Looking up into the column from here on Earth, the shape will resemble less the squatter man and more like two bells stuck end to end with a donut between them. And that's because you are looking through more column material. There is a wide range of representations and hence interpretations of the highest energy phases of the diminishing number of toruses in the stacks. The remains of the top and bottom toruses forms what appear to be arms and legs, which can be pointed either up or down. The head of the figure may be absent. When it is present, it occasionally resembles a bird or other animal. Sometimes the bottom of the figures is split into three parts and the remnant of the original central axis extending below the legs has often been identified as a tail, which has been taken to indicate a male spirit. However, if the axis end is larger and oval in shape, it has been interpreted as a vulva or even the image of childbirth. We often see faces in leaves on a tree or in other features in everyday life, but there's nobody there. It seems that we see what we want to see and what follows are groups of similar images of the squatter man phases from the multiple toruses to the single toros form. 
Since the electric current flow isn't constant, there will be fluctuations in both the number of toruses that can be seen at any given time or their prominence as well. The Earth's magnetic pole doesn't stay put. It has a habit of wandering around. An oblique view would occur when the magnetic pole was on the opposite side of the Earth and you look up into the column and view the image at an angle from below. An oblique view of the column at this stage depicting a prominent single toros would be reminiscent of someone playing with a hula hoop. Currently, the magnetic axis is on our side of the pole, so should it recur in the near future, you would be looking up into the column. As the energy intensifies, the plasma image brightens appreciatively. The stick men then become a squatting figure with what appears to be a face with two eyes. The bright stack looks overexposed and the eyes prominent and ghostly. The accompanying figures show the single toros, central axis, and bell-shaped top and bottom. Two eyes are visible in the shape between the toros and the axis. As the intensity of the event reaches maximum, the eyes are just about the only feature discernible, but many more traits of the prehistoric aurora event have been assimilated into the modern times without the original meaning, and only now are we beginning to understand this, and of course is the legacy of Anthony Peratt to share this knowledge for free with the subscribers of the Lost History channel, so then you can understand a past that is literally lost to history. Comments below, and as always guys, thank you for watching.